Welcome to another edition of the Helipod. As always, we are brought to you by Viore. Invest in your happiness and comfort with the finest athleisure wear on the planet. If you're a regular listener, you know how much I love Viore. Just go to vioreclothing.com, V-U-O-R-I, clothing.com slash helipod for 20% off today. You get a little three-quarter zip on today. They have great t-shirts. Their shorts with built-in liners, the core short, is absolutely unbelievable. From yoga to Peloton to hoops to traveling, if you're doing that yet, it's perfect. I promise you, Viori, V-U-O-R-I, clothing.com slash helipod, 20% off, free shipping today. Trust me, try it. It feels great. It actually is the softest, most comfortable material on the planet. And we're going to send a free box to my buddy, Sean O'Hara, who is our guest coming up on the Helipod right now. All right, as promised, he is an NFL Network analyst. He does some work with Giants Radio. He's a Super Bowl champ. He's a three-time Pro Bowler. And he's actually the third offensive lineman to be on the helipod. And I'm, I'm actually embarrassed to say he should have been the first. I had another center, um, you know, Ryan Khalil, and we had Mark Schlereth on our last episode. So we're going lineman heavy, big boy. I love it. I will say I'm a little, I'm a little disappointed that I'm, I'm not number one. You know, you, you find out a lot about your friends when they get a, their own podcast and, <laughs> you know, and they cleverly name it the helipod. And then you, you realize like you're, you're low man on the total pole when you're the third alignment. But I will say this, you know, to, to be third to Ryan Khalil and stink is uh that's pretty good company and ryan khalil and i think might have been separated at birth and the fact that he's a, a manhattanite there uh, in, in manhattan beach with you that, that that makes sense i get it and it's funny because mark schlerer i remember being at the sps um after we won super bowl 42 and i saw mark schlerer on the red carpet he was there with his girls like he's got three daughters yeah um and i went over to him because i used to watch film on him and tom nailing um, and Doug Neal, back when the Broncos were running that 38 slash play with TD, and they were one of the, the best offensive lines working together. And I told Stink, I said, hey, man, I love what you're doing post-career. I'm coming for you. I want your job. And he was like, <laughs> bring it on. I love it. He's like, it'd be great to do stuff in the booth. So, uh, yeah, Stink was uh, he, he was a, a trailblazer and somebody that I was trying to emulate post-career as well. Yeah, who was another one? It was Bill Moss. Did Bill Moss? Uh, he did stuff in the booth for a little while for CBS, yeah. didn't he? Or was that Fox? Bill Moss did. I mean, you know, look, John Madden kind of made offensive line fun. Of course, um, you know, to, to watch some of that, and and you know, Schlereth was doing it. You know, Baldy and Baldy was out there doing it. Um, even Tony Siragusa, I used to tease him all the time. I'd see him on game day, and I'm like, "What do you even do? Like, what? <laughs> what like, he's standing down under the goalpost, and he's like, they're like." Hey, Goose, what's going on there? He's like, I don't know. I just throw mustard on my shirt. I got a hot dog. This guy just gave me a beer. And I think that the defense is getting a good pass rush. I'm like, you've got the best gig ever. Um, oh, there's no yeah. doubt, man. I, I, now that I've gone through some of those production meetings with Fox, you know, pregame, they're, they're, it's a pretty intricate process. And you sit down and you talk and you do all this prep for these meetings. And I always wondered when I watched Goose, now looking back, uh, how, how much he actually did, because that was the best job going. He just, he just kind of hung out. It was awesome. So just, to, you know, I, I love Goose. He's a great dude. He's a Jersey boy. He's from Kinelon, New Jersey. Um, you know, he's got, a, I think he's got a restaurant. He's got a couple of buddies that are still doing things for him. But anytime he would call the Giants game, he would be in the meeting rooms. Like you'd walk in and he'd be in there talking to Tiki. He's got his feet up on the, on the desk. He's like the veteran, you know, and he'd have a cold beer in his hand and he'd be watching him and be like, what's going on? What do you guys, what do you guys watch? Third down blitzes, you know, he'd be talking trash. And then inevitably, You'd see him in the training room. He'd be he'd be in the training room asking for Toradol. I said, "Yeah, my back's really bothering me. Can, can I get some? Can I get some Toradol? Can I get some anti-inflammatories?" He'd be hitting up the training staff for for some uh, some relief. That's hilarious, man. I you know it's interesting. If I were a coach, I would always welcome in the broadcast crew and let them sit in meetings, especially former players. Right? It's a lot easier for you guys than it is for a traditional broadcaster like myself to kind of acclimate 
you know, yourself to, to a, a coach that you may not know as well as a former player would, but I'm always surprised by the coaches who are a little standoffish in everything I do, not just the NFL, but whether it's basketball, whether, you know, it's UFC and you're talking to a trainer or a manager, I would, I would, it's the, always the easiest thing to do from a media standpoint, just wrap your arms around and bring them in, show them a great time. And then whether it's during the game or whether it's during a post game show, you're going to be more apt to be kind to them if things don't go as planned. You know, isn't it ironic? You know, we think about these coaches as like the smartest guys in the building and, you know, they've been around football. Like that's something so archaic. Just, you know what? This person is going to talk about you and your team for the next four hours. Right. Why wouldn't you want to bring them in? And, hey, man, like, listen, listen, let's talk about it and create a little bit of a bond to your point. So that, you know what? If you have a clunker of a day, maybe they're not dropping the people's elbow on you. Um, you know, it's it's not just for coaches, too. It's players as well. You know, I remember, you know, early on in my career, like players would go out on the field and they would see, you know, Troy or they would see, you know, um, Al Michaels or, you know, Pat Summerall, or you you'd see guys that are calling the game and they would be like nervous to go say hi to them. And I'll give credit to my dad because he was the first one to tell me this and plant the seed. And he was like, dude, you should go up to them before every game and introduce yourself and say hi. And I was like, why would I do that? And he's like, you never know. You never know when they're going to have a chance. So sure enough, we're playing the Dallas Cowboys. I think it was, and Troy was calling the game. And I just happened to be, I mean, it happened organically. I didn't force it, but I was walking on the field and he had just said, was talking to Eli and was walking by. And so I just went over and I said, you know, Hey, Troy, you know, I introduced myself and, you know, he was complimentary and he was like, yeah, you know what? You're having a great year, this and that. And I'm thinking to myself, yeah, right. You <laughs> no way you're watching the old lineman. I, I know what you're watching, but lo and behold, Helly, during that game, I made a nice block on a run play and sure enough, Troy, Hey, there's a center Sean O'Hare. Boom. And it happened just like that. And I, I call my dad. I'm like, you were so money. You were so right. It's, it's a no brainer, you know, for players and for coaches. Look, they're there. They want to make you look good. They want to talk about you. You know, when you and I have shared a booth together, you want good stories. You want fun right. things to share and you want, you know, information. And I think the trust is the biggest thing. They, they want to trust. Look, if I tell you something, you're not going to make me look bad and air out my laundry. But like, oh, I was talking to so-and-so and he said, this guy stinks. You know, guess what? You lose all that trust right now. Right. God, who was it? I'm trying to remember. It was this year. I think it was Brian Greasy who said something in a production meeting. And this, it was at the yeah. end of a game. And it was kind of a throwaway line, but it ended it up. Nick in, Foles. Oh, it was. was. Nick Foles and the Bears. And he said, you know, the game plan or something like that. And I created this whole brouhaha. Like Nick Foles had to come out and apologize for what he said to greasy in the production meeting. He's like, I didn't mean for it to be in that light. And right. you know, it's, it's created a, a huge mess. Well, every, it seems like every year there's one or two of those, right. Which causes coaches and players to maybe draw back a little bit, but you're, you're so right. I remember I called a, uh, a Pepperdine basketball game. And after the game, I'm talking to Lorenzo Romar, who's a really good coach, coach at university of Washington is at Pepperdine. And we, I don't know how we started talking about my 12 year old son. And I was talking about how, um, you know, he's a great hustler out in the court, but you know, he's young. He's not strong enough. He hasn't really got that shooting form down yet. He said, where is he? And he, I said, he's over there in the stands. He said, bring him down. And he worked with him for 15 minutes on right. shooting free throws and his form and drills. I just thought it was the coolest thing ever. He will never forget that. I'll never forget that from Lorenzo Romar. And it seems like such an easy thing to do, but you know, there's a lot of guys that, uh, that just don't take the time to do that. that. That's awesome. That's a great story. And you know what, as, as a dad, it's, it was probably pretty cool, but you're also probably over there saying like, that's exactly what I've been telling him. He won't listen to me. I, I you're in the car. You're like, son, I, I told you, you put the hand in the cookie jar. It's the, you know, he tells you the same thing. And now it's like the light bulb goes on. Oh, I get it. But cause his dad telling me, I don't right. want to hear it. Yeah, no, you're, you're 1000% right. So it, it was took everything I had not to say I told you so when we we're in the car, but uh, it, <laughs> it was, a, it was a cool moment. Um, your career was fascinating to me. And we've talked about this many a times over the years. And I want to get to that in just a minute, but let's get to a few kind of current events topics and some things that you've been talking about on Good Morning Football when you've been filling in um, the last week or so. And uh, I, I just want to, we got to start with quarterbacks because once again, um, that is the above the fold to use the old uh, newspaper phrase uh, story um, that's going around. And, and Russell Wilson, uh, I believe you guys talked about this on the show today, 
over a third of the league has contacted the Seahawks about the availability of, of Russell Wilson. It, it, it could take or would take as many as uh, three first round picks. Um, if you were the Seahawks, would you even, could you fathom trading Russell for three first round picks and a couple of players? I don't, I don't see any way it happens, you know, but I, I feel like, you know, I, I hear that news and, you know, I, to me, all these different things come flooding into my mind. Number one, I think about these GMs normally this time of year, they're traveling, right. They're right. flying everywhere to see kids and pro days and getting pre like they're, they have nothing to do. You know, they're like, they're watching film and there's half the film because, you know, half the kids didn't even play last year. And, you know, with the pandemic, there's less football to watch. So, you know, hey, let's talk. Let's find a way. But I don't see any way that the Seattle Seahawks would trade Russell Wilson. I don't care if you gave him four first round picks because the bottom line is, all right, that's great that we're going to get all these draft picks, but who's, somebody still has to play quarterback. And let's face it, without Russell Wilson and what he's been able to do for that franchise over the last couple of years, they would not be relevant. And I think you can't trade away talent like that. He's certainly generational. Um, but I also look at it like, like this, you know, there's always a little bit of, of truth in, in all the information that we get in today's world. Right. So there is some truth. Yeah. There's probably teams that are calling Seattle and they're doing it under the cloak, Kelly of, well, let's talk Russell Wilson. Yeah. You know, okay. And then what they really want to do is they want to find out who else are you willing to trade? Let's start off. I'm going to open you up with Russell Wilson. You're going to shut the door on that really quick. But while right. I got you on the phone and, you know, hey, let's see what else. Because I think the one thing people don't realize is how much these general managers talk to each other all the time. I mean, it's not just like, you know, once in a while. They're constantly talking to each other and communicating and trying to find out who who has what player that, that they would be willing to part with and, you know, what the value is with all that. So, um, you know, I know that right now, when there's slow news cycles, we take the smallest little spark and we, we turn it into a bonfire for Russell Wilson right now, you know, he made the comment about how he's tired of getting hit. And so people are trying to connect dots and all right, he wants out of Seattle. He's been getting hit. Like the old lineman in me starts coming out, Dan. Yeah. Did, say, that, did that raise your eyebrows at least a little bit? Yeah. Well, I say, look, no quarterback wants to get hit, but the, the, the solution to that is get the ball out, you know? And, and if you're back there burping the baby, and you're running around, you know, trying to be dangerous, Wilson, you can't blame that and those hits on your offensive line. Tom Brady doesn't get hit because he gets the ball out, and he knows where to go if you take away number one and number two. He's always got an exit strategy. He's always got an out with the ball. Sometimes Russell doesn't have that, and he has always relied on his athletic ability to get him out of a jam. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. You know, you kind of live by that sword and die by that sword. But Russell, yeah, he's been one of the most sacked quarterbacks in the league. So has Deshaun Watson. They're also two of the most athletic quarterbacks in the, right. in the league. So don't tell me it's all offensive line. That's them trying to extend the play, trying to make, you know, chicken salad out of chicken, you know what. Well, so let me ask you about the other big, I mean, the big quarterback story. And that is Deshaun Watson, as you mentioned. Um, Schrager uh, this week, Peter Schrager had a little trade proposal, which – after doing a little research, I found was very similar to Peter King. So we're going to call this the Peters uh, mm. trade proposal. It was two first round picks, Teddy Bridgewater, Christian McCaffrey, Robbie Anderson, and defensive end Brian Burns for Deshaun Watson. Obviously, they don't want to trade Deshaun Watson. I mean, this, this guy's 25 years old. He's a franchise quarterback. Yeah, he's making a lot of money now, but you know how that works. And the newest house in the market gets paid the most three years from now. That's going to be a much more manageable contract. Um, but he, he could push the envelope there and he, he could force them to, to make a trade. And because he has a no trade clause in his contract, he gets to pick his destination. A let's just start with this. Cause you're not supposed to ask double barreled questions. So let me be a good interviewer here. Do you think the Texans should make that move? If Deshaun says you, you gotta, you gotta trade me, I'm not playing here. Or do you think they should play hardball? I mean, if Deshaun, you know, if he basically tells them, look, I, no matter what, I, I, find me, do whatever, I'm not coming, and I'm not, I'm not stepping foot in the building, um, you know, then, then you got to reassess and you, and you got <clears throat> to, got to play damage control. But if I'm Nick Casario, I'm a brand new GM, 
you want me to come in and, and trade the most valuable player on the entire team and, and a guy who's meant so much to the city of Houston, to that entire franchise. Um, look, I want to be able to go out to dinner in my own city too. And, you know, they just traded DeAndre Hopkins the year before. Now we're going to trade Deshaun Watson. I'm, guess what? I'm, I'm, I'm staying at home for dinner. I don't trust the restaurants in the town, but I just <laughs> traded your, your two best players and JJ Watts on his way out the door too. So I don't think Nick Casario wants that on his, you know, to start off his tenure there. Um, and, and I think, you know, the, the, the problem with that too is, all right, fine. We trade Deshaun Watson, we get all this capital, but we still need somebody to play quarterback and we still got to find a way to win games. So, yeah, I, I don't think you're, to me, it doesn't feel like a win trading Deshaun Watson. And if I'm the Houston Texans, if I'm David Coley, their new head coach, I'm, I'm doing everything in our power to, to make sure that Deshaun, understands that he's with us and that we want him to be our franchise quarterback moving forward. You know, the one kicker I'll say with Deshaun is you just signed a monster deal. So, you know, you can't sign a big contract like that and cash the check and then all of a sudden decide I want out, you know, they're those contracts, you know, I mean, look, they're, they're, they're a little bit one-sided in the fact that they team can, can opt out, but to have a, a rip cord on that, you know, so soon in the sign and a new deal, uh, seems a little bit, you know, a little bit sideways. But on the on the counterpoint, if I'm David Tepper, and I find out that you're trying to trade all my best players for one guy and a couple of first round draft picks, I, I'm not going to be very happy with the GM for the Carolina Panthers if I'm David Tepper, um, the owner of the Carolina Panthers. So that to me just seemed like, man, that's a heck of a lot to to offer up. I think Christian McCaffrey was a part of that yeah. proposed trade by the Peters. Um, that was my my biggest beef with that is, you know, you, you're not trading. Christian McCaffrey. And, um, you know, I know everybody wants all these first round draft picks, but you know, you, you got games to play this year. You, you can't, you can't, you can't say, well, we're going to be good in 2022 and 23, you know, people don't have that much patience. So, you know, it's, it, it's an interesting banter because Deshaun said he's not happy with the organization where it is, but um, you know, I think we've also seen players, you know, Nika is probably the last one I just saw. He demanded a trade. And then it didn't work out. And he was like, yeah, you know what? Duvall's not so bad. You know? and, uh, <laughs> and he ended up did getting trade, traded twice, two more times after that. So right. be careful what you wish for. Well, it's interesting you bring up David Tepper because he is uh, reportedly enamored with getting a franchise quarterback. And they signed Teddy to that three-year, $63 million deal. And they just realized that his ceiling really wasn't very high. And I don't know why it took them uh, until now to realize that. I mean, Teddy's adequate. But he, he's not in the top half of the league in terms of quarterbacks. But, uh, yeah, so Tepper really wants to get that franchise guy. I'm fascinated to see how that's going to work out. And I do feel like the NFL is trending in the direction of the NBA where the players really control more. It is different because the contracts aren't fully guaranteed. But, you know, I'm sure you heard Draymond Green say, hey, why can't we – pick when we want to play if potentially we're going to be traded you know he was talking about other teams shutting down players i think it was the pistons uh with drummond you know shutting him down because he was in trade talks um what as a former player what is your take on that in terms of you know teams can dictate certain things and players can dictate certain things is that is that good for football to be heading in that direction yeah, I mean, and I don't want to feel like the king of the hill guy, like, hey, you know what, I mean, this is the way it is, it's the way it's supposed to be, and, you know, get off my damn lawn, you know, but I, I feel like, look, in the NFL, there's a 53-man roster, and as a player, you, you, you focus on your job, you do your job to the best of your ability, you let other people make decisions, I'll say this, Tom Brady, if anybody earned the right to have control or input on decisions, it would have been Tom Brady, right, and he had none. I mean, Wes Walker was one of his best friends, cut. You know, Logan Mankins was one of his you know, right. good friends up front, traded. Um, you know, you saw Tom Brady struggle with, hey, you know, like uh, these are some guys that I really want. Inevitably, he left. Um, you know, I don't think he had, you know, uh, power down in Tampa Bay. But, you know, I think that they probably listened to him a little bit and he felt like he could could you know, speak some things into existence. I don't know, but man. He he he. You know, whether it's Gronk or AB, he, he lobbied a lot more than he had in New England, right? Yeah, no doubt. He 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 spoke a couple of those things into existence and he lobbied for a couple of guys and they listened. I don't know that every franchise is like that, but it definitely feels man like things are changing. The, the landscape of the NFL is changing. It has been it had been slowly morphing to a, a little bit of a different 
relationship players and teams and the way the power of, of certain players. I feel like with this pandemic, I feel like it, it accelerated that shift because the, the players aren't in the building as much now. And, you know, you're, you're kind of like you're showing up to practice, you leave, you show up for games, you leave. It, they, like, it's almost like the teams don't have as much control over the players. There's, there was no offseason last year. There was, hard, there was no preseason games. So it, it almost feels like that has created a shift in power for the players. And it's like, hey, look, you can't hold this other stuff over our head anymore because we're not doing it. And now that we have basically eliminated that from the season, we're not going back to that. And that, that is, is something that we would have never been able to wrestle away from the owners during CBA negotiations without having to give something up. Right, right. Um, you're in New Jersey, um, obviously former giant, but certainly you, you see and hear a lot of news about the Jets. What's the feeling up there with Sam Darnold right now? Because I, I feel like there's almost been a, sh a shift where people fully expected them to move on from Darnold. And now because they don't have the number one pick, people are starting to say, well, maybe we could be just as good off with Darnold as we would be with, say, Luke Wilson, and we should give it a shot. Uh, obviously, they have to figure that out really soon because he's going to be owed a lot of money if, if he sticks around. But what, what's the consensus up there with the fan base, do you think? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and you know, I, I'll say this, you know, there's – uh, the Jets fan base, they are passionate, but you cannot call them stable. Um, you know, they, <laughs> they, they, you will fall out of favor in a New York minute with the Jets fans. And I kind of feel like Sam, there's a, there's a big contingency that, that are done with Sam and, and they, they want something new. And it's ironic because, you know, Jets fans and, you know, this is NFL fans all together. They would, they would much rather live and, and be emotionally attached to the potential of a quarterback coming out of college that has never thrown an NFL pass then to hey maybe this guy can actually get better and can improve. So I think for Sam Darnold, the, the biggest questions really are just inside the building. And I think Joe Douglas has, has spoken well on his behalf and Joe Douglas has seen the hot mess that he's been in for the last couple of years. You know, the, the system was not working very well. They, they couldn't block people up front. I mean, you know, Sam Darnold, you know, he was, you know, it looked like his head was spinning, you know, and he'll never outlive the audio of him on, you know, that October night, you know, yeah. seeing ghosts, um, you know, he, he just, he, he, he was really struggling. And I, the thing I remind people and Jets fans all the time, I say, look, this is not a quarterback fix. Like the Jets, you're not going to come in and bring in a different quarterback and everything is better. And they're a better team. This is so much more. They, they have a dysfunctional roster. They just purged Jamal Adams last year, Le'Veon Bell. Joe Douglas is trying to reshape this thing and, and build it for the long run, build it the right way. I think Sam could be a part of that because I think in the building, they think Sam still has some potential. And, and we have not seen the best Sam Darnold um, that, that we could have because and it's been hard to evaluate because of all these things. Even when he did have good protection sometimes, his receivers were banged up most of the year last year. So – it was really tough to see them, you know, at full power and really get a true evaluation. I think Sam come out of college, couldn't even buy a beer. So he probably could have had one more year in college yeah, and that would have probably helped him. So I'm all for giving Sam another year. And to your point, there, there are some good quarterbacks coming out. If you're the Jets, you're in a great spot. You've got a quarterback that could turn things around. It, he could turn his career around with this new offense with Michael LaFleur and he could blossom into a really good quarterback if you do it the right way and you have the second pick overall, you could get an unbelievable amount of equity because the quarterback that teams are going to want to trade up for are going to be there at two. So I think for Joe Douglas, that's going to be the biggest decision for him is how much can I get for that second overall pick? And it, I, I can't afford to not trade back out of that position to help build my roster for the long haul. I find myself rooting for people as much as I do for teams as I get a little bit older and I don't know Joe Douglas personally, but I, I know he's close with some people that we've worked with and they speak very highly of him. I am rooting for Joe Douglas. When there was that picture of him, you know, in the, in the box and he was looked like he was sleeping, who knows, he could have been looking at his phone or whatever. I'm like, oh, I, he has had the shittiest two years and I think he's going to be a very good general manager if he can just get things, has to get over the hump, obviously. 
Yeah, and and you know what? I think what's going to be interesting with this is is Woody Johnson's coming back into the fold. You know, he was the uh, the ambassador in the UK uh, for us, and, yep. and now him coming back, it'll be it'll be interesting to see how involved he is with all the processes and the decisions and, and what kind of leeway he gives Joe as far as, Hey, look, go out and free agency and get this guy. Cause they've got a ton of money in free agency too. Yeah. Um, so they're, they're going to be a very active team this off season. Um, I think it's going to please a lot of Jets fans and I think they're going to do it the right way. I'll say this, Joe Douglas hit a home run with Mekhi Becton, you know, their left tackle. He's the size of a planet. I mean, he was eliminating guys. He was throwing guys into the stands. Um, so th- that left side of that offensive line, is is gonna look uh, gonna look pretty big and pretty stout next year. So, uh, you know, for the Jets, I, I think that things things are on the up for them. Um, I think this coaching staff that they just hired, I think Sala is is gonna bring a, a totally different mindset, more accountability into that building, and I think Jets fans will be pleased. Well, all right, that's that's a lot more uh, Jets talk than I anticipated, O'Hara. So I'll I'll, I'll get you off that for a minute. Um, I do want to ask you one more question before we get to the uh, the storied career of uh, of Sean O'Hara, and it, it is another quarterback question. It's a Patriots man. What do you what do you mm. do if you're Bill Belichick up there? You you got Cam that you could bring back, make a trade for Jimmy G. Marcus Mariota's out there. He's Mariota's scheduled to make over ten million dollars as a backup, and the Raiders have cap issues. You know, there's also you can make a run at Jameis. I know Sean said he wants to bring him back, but he's a free agent. You know, Trubisky. And then, you know, there's the draft. You could, you have that kind of mid, mid round uh, draft pick where you could get somebody in the teens. What, what do you do there if you're the Patriots? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and I think, you know, Cam Newton was, you know, they, they, they gave it a shot. And I, I think what they realized too was, man, it's not easy for a quarterback to come in here and, and to give us the same kind of production, the same kind of consistency that we've had for the last 20 years. They're just not all cut from the same cloth as Tom Brady and, you know, Cam has recently come out and talked about how the mental aspect of being with the Patriots and um, the mental stamina that he needed, you know, was really eye-opening and and I think it made him better. So, you know, look, if you're a quarterback, I I think that that would be a a great place. One of those guys you talk about, like a Marcus Mariota, James James Winston, if if I'm Jameis, I, I mean, I love New Orleans, but if they're ready to move on and bring somebody else in, I'm absolutely chomping at the bit to get up to New England, number one, to get on the field. But number two, if if anybody can fix my decision-making, my turnovers, it's the Patriot way, right? It's Bill Belichick, it's Josh McDaniels. So I think that would be huge for them. I'll be honest with you, I was shocked that the Patriots didn't go after Andy Dalton last year in free agency and Dallas scooped him up pretty quick. Yeah, I thought he was a guy that, you know, they would, they would be all over. He was kind of flying under the radar kid can can sling it and, and he's a smart kid too so it'll be interesting to see what the Patriots do um you know I I think uh, Mariota could be an interesting aspect I think Bill Belichick being a defensive minded coach he knows how hard it is to prepare for an athletic quarterback he had a pocket quarterback for 20 years and when you look at the way they used Cam you know, there's no way they had a, any of those plays in when Tom Brady was there. <laughs> and the quarterback runs, Think. the quarter, you know, down in the red zone, all of a sudden you got an extra blocker. Look, there, there's something to be said for that, especially if you're, if you're playing up in Gillette in November and December, as you know. I mean, it can be a, a total wreck up there. So, um, you know, there, I, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't rule Kim Moon out altogether. Yeah, I think there's a chance that they could, they could bring him back and bring somebody else in there to, to groom. I out of all those guys, I don't know. I just wouldn't give up a bunch of draft picks for, for Jimmy Garoppolo. And despite the fact a lot of people feel like San Francisco is willing to move on from Jimmy, I feel like they have to have somebody in place, obviously, before they do that. Um, having called a bunch of Titans games over the years, I, I think Mariota could, could be effective up there. I, I don't know long-term, uh, but I do think that price is right. You know, if you bring Mariota up there, like you brought Cam in. So essentially it's a one-year deal for 10 and a half million, roughly what they were paying Cam. I, you know, that could give you one more window, but you get all those guys back. If you're the Patriots that opted out defensively, um, you know, you're going to be better. I don't know if you're a Super Bowl contender, but you're, you're going to be better. I, that's, that's enough. That's probably the second most after the Deshaun Watson situation uh, in terms of off season storylines, the Patriots quarterback situation is the second most interesting storyline to me. What, what would be the second to you if, if, if Deshaun's number one? 
Um, yeah, I mean, I think the Patriots quarterback situation is interesting. Um, I'm curious to see what's going, what, what's going to happen in Chicago. Yeah, you know, with with Trubisky, with Foles. Um, you know, I know there's been some banter about Deshaun Watson going there. Um, and then, you know, really, the to me, the fall from grace for Carson Wentz in Philly has just been astounding. You know, I, I think you go back and, and you look at the draft and them taking Jalen Hurts, and it was kind of like, all right, yeah, it makes sense because, you know, Carson is, has been banged up and he hasn't been healthy. They've always really had to rely on their backup quarterback. And it kind of felt like that was just the safety valve. And then all of a sudden Jalen's got a package and he's on the field and he's getting reps. And then, then you hear the whispers and things start to just all of a sudden snowball and man, Carson just had a tough year. And the one thing I'll say is, you know, I, I don't ever look at games and say, man, that quarterback lost the game or man, that quarterback won the game. I'm mean, look, he might make a great throw, but it, it's always a team effort for me. I look at the Philadelphia Eagles. They were a train wreck and up front is where that train started and ended that collision. I mean, it was a, it was a 25 car pile up and that's probably how many offensive linemen they went through during the it season. Is. They, yeah. they had more starting all line combinations than any team in the league. Uh, they were running through tackles. They, they went through three tackles in one game, I think. So when you look at Carson Wentz, hell, he was sacked 50 times last year, 50 more than any quarterback in the league. And he didn't even play the last four games. So that's that incredible. tells you how many times he was sacked, let alone hit. I call it PTSD. It's post-traumatic stress disorder. Ask David Carr about it. I'm sure you've had him on your helipod. He was probably number one. Unlike me, I was number three. <laughs> but look, it's a real thing, you know. And yeah. all of a sudden, if you're dropping back on a quick five-step count and the ball is supposed to come out and you're getting hit as that ball is coming out, guess what? You remember that. And guess the next third down, all of a sudden that ball, I'm not trusting the pocket. And when you look at film of Carson Wentz, a lot of his bad plays are because he didn't trust the pocket. And, you know, I saw it happen to Eli. We've seen it happen to, to even Peyton Manning. We've seen him duck down when there was nobody even around him and right. get himself up because, you know, you, you, you don't trust the pocket. And that's really where I felt like Car happened to Carson. And I think it was an economical move, you know, more so than anything. But that, that was shocking. Yeah, I, I think it was it was economical. I also think there's just no way you could bring Carson back to that locker room, considering how many coaches they had already gone through. And um, I, that's that's a double headed storyline there, right? What what happens in Philly, and then how well Carson does in Indianapolis? Um, you are correct. We did have David Carr on the helipod. Went up to his uh, mansion in Bakersfield, oh, yeah. dude. Yeah, he's got a ranch, right? He's got let, spread. Let me tell you something about that property. It, it is, I, it's like, uh, what, it, what was Michael Jackson's Neverland Ranch? Like, that's what yeah. it felt like. He had, wow. he had like a mini skate park. He had, uh, I think it was a 75 yard football field. He had two pools with a, um, what are those rivers? Like they have at La Disney lazy river with the lazy river. Uh, wow. he had a guest house that his folks lived in. His brother was building a place next door. He had a huge barn where he would bring the kids from the high school where his brother Darren coaches to work out. And he would bring some, uh, some other kids in there from, from school. It was amazing. Um, and awesome. you know what he said? He said, he said, when you live in Bakersfield, Helly, you have to bring the fun to you. And he did. So he built his Neverland ranch in Bakersfield. It's pretty good. That's true. And when you're the number one overall pick, you know, you can do things like that. Time for a quick break to tell you about a couple of our sponsors. The first is Greens Plus, a leader since 1989, known for creating the first ever blended green superfood powder and the first company to infuse that green superfood powder into a bar. Greens Plus bars and powders are the best tasting, most effective way to improve your immunity, detox your body, boost your energy, and get that nutritional insurance that your body needs from organic, gluten-free, premium green superfoods. You can get it at Whole Foods, Amazon, or greensplus.com. We're gonna give you free shipping and 20% off today if you use the promo code HELLY. That's greensplus.com. Also wanted to tell you about VACO. That's V-A-C-O. At VACO, 
they invest in your career so you are here for the duration of theirs. Vaco is a premier talent and solutions firm that provides boutique level service with global reach in the areas of consulting, consultative project resources, executive search, permanent placement, and strategic staffing. Areas of expertise include C-suite search, accounting, finance, technology, healthcare IT, operations, administration, and international managed services. Founded by my good buddy, Brian Waller, and a couple of his friends. In 2002, Baco has grown to serve over 40 markets across the globe. They have 1,000 employees, 5,000 consultants, and $750 million in revenue. Check them out at Vaco.com. That's V-A-C-O.com for more info on how Vaco connects people to their dream jobs and helps leading companies find talent to grow their businesses. Carr was the number one overall pick and you were undrafted out of Rutgers. And the one story that I remember we talked about, um, it was a nameless scout from a nameless team that I that came to work you out. And I, I think, I hope this is okay to tell because we're not naming the guy, but I think you, you told me that you could, um, you could kind of smell uh, the night before on this guy. Yeah. Yeah. This is uh, this Rutgers didn't have a pro day. So number one, I didn't get invited to the combine either. My, my first invitation to the combine came from the NFL network as an analyst. Um, <laughs> but I didn't get invited to the combine Rutgers didn't have a pro day. So, we had like a couple of couch, a couple of coaches, Dave Steckel and Charlie West, who were kind of our liaisons, and they would call contacts and try to say, "Hey, we got a couple of kids. You want to come take a look at them?" And it was like, "All right, when am I going to be driving through Jersey? Hey, I'll be coming up the Turnpike on a Thursday at 9 a.m. Can you work out then?" And so, you know, who, I'm not going to say no to us to an offensive line of coach or a scout. So yeah, this it wasn't a scout; it was an O line coach for an okay. NFL team. Uh, actually I've told the story before it was Mike Tice. Like there's, there's no need to not drop names. <laughs> it, it was big old Mike Tice. Anybody that's ever met Mike Tice, he looks like bull from night court. I mean, he's huge. He's, he's like, he might as well be seven feet tall. He's that a former he's a tight end man. dude, but he looks like an offensive tackle. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He was, he was blocking. He wasn't running a lot of routes. Um, so, but Tice, yeah, he came, he said, Hey, I'm going to work you out. Um, I'll be there at 9. AM. So I, I was there at 8 30 AM you know, warming up, getting ready. Normally you start out with like height and weight and then you kind of start out in the weight room, do your bench press 225, your vertical leap, and then you go out on the field and do your 40 and do your drills. And, um, you know, nine o'clock shows up and I'm like, you know, I'm a young kid. I'm looking out, oh, is he here yet? Is he here yet? 9.05, all right, yeah, a couple minutes late, no big deal. 9.15, 9.30, 9.45, I'm like, yeah, this is it. And like, all right, it's not happening. I think he showed up around 9.50 or maybe 10 o'clock, but he was 45 minutes to an hour late. And hair is a mess. He looked like Roy Munson, you know, from Kingpin. The hair was all over the place, you know, a little red-eyed. So, uh, yeah, that was that, that was my uh, one of my first O-line workouts. Um, my favorite part of the story is we, we get done with the, the height, the weight, the bench press. We go up to the field. And he's like, what do you want to do first? And I'm like, run the 40. I want to get it over with, you know? And he's like, okay, sure. So I get down there, like, you ready? Yeah, I get the signal. Okay, we're ready. Okay, I get in my stance, fire up, boom, run a 40. Helly, I think I might have broke five all. I mean, it might have been one of my best 40s ever. The start was great. I had a great finish. And, you know, I turn around and I'm like, man, I'm like, that felt good. I'm like, what'd you get? And he's like looking at the thing and he's shaking the stop while he's like, I missed it. Oh, no. And I'm like, what? I'm like, what do you mean you missed it? Yeah, yeah, you had one job. How do you miss it? And he's like, ah, <laughs> thing didn't really it didn't start. And I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. So yeah, it was uh, it, it was an uphill struggle. And uh, I give Tice credit. He goes, do, do you want to run it again? And I said, well, no, I don't want to run it again. He's all right. Well, what do you think you ran? Oh no way. And I'm like, I'm like, I don't know. He's like, well, what's your best? I'm like, 502. He goes, sounds good to me. So that's amazing. Rode down a 502. Big Tice. Who was it? Who was it that we talked to, Sean? There was somebody that set up the 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 40. They like measured it off themselves before their pro day started. And it was probably, you know, like like 38 yards as opposed to 40. Do you remember that story? No, no, but it's it's I mean that's a great move. I mean, yeah. I don't know how you I don't know how you'd cut it at 38. Like maybe it's you know, 38 and usually, a half. I, yeah, right. usually like standing on the line and you start on a white line. So right. like unless they were all the way down there and they started on 
on the with their hand on the one yard line. Maybe it was a little league field. There were there were no Smart. there were no football lines. I don't know. Yeah, that um, sounds so- like that sounds like something that our boy Reggie Wayne would have done. <laughs> Reg, Re- hey Re- Reg has the famous story about again another helipod guest uh, at the Senior Bowl how he didn't have any of his gear there, so he was wearing you know, hand me down gear from other guys. And he was, his cleats didn't fit. His helmet was wrong. He didn't have his, like his own gloves. And he kind of got worked the first day there. And then his gear all of a sudden arrived from Miami and it, it was magical. And, you know, the big question on him was speed. And God, I'm trying to remember who the, oh, it was Fred Smoot. He said he was going up against Fred Smoot. And all he remembers was that he just was working him on these crossing routes, just, mm. just one after the other. And it was once he got his gear. So I don't, I don't remember. I got to figure out who that 40 yard story is from. So you, uh, you end up in Cleveland, your rookie year, undrafted free agent out of Rutgers. Um, was, was Chris Palmer, the coach. I know Butch came the next yeah. year. Chris Palmer, yeah, Chili, Chili Palmer, Chili Palmer. So you're there as an undrafted free agent. It's Cleveland. They're not very good. Um, what's going through your head that that first rookie mini camp or training camp and 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 what do you remember most about that well for me it was all about survival and making the team you know i was an undrafted guy like you said so i, I was i knew i was a little bit of a camp body um you know but the browns had just came back in 99 so this was 2000 this was year two of the new franchise coming back and it was a pretty young team so uh, i felt like it was my best shot to, to make an nfl roster and um, you know, I just remember thinking, look, I, I, we have a team period with, you know, 15 plays. I might get two plays. So we'll just make them count. Um, and my big thing was just mentally, I, I couldn't cut myself. Like, I can't have any mental errors. You know, physically, if you get beat as a rookie, you could, people can accept that you're going to get better, but you can't be yourself. So um, that was something I learned from, from Chili Palmer. And then my own line coach was Tony Sperano, rest his soul. Um, and, he, you know, they were both East Coast guys. And, um, they actually knew my agent at the time, Joe Lintas. I think that kind of helped me out a little bit. They kind of, you know, helped, gave me a little bit of, uh, you know, some guys in my corner. Um, but that year, Ellie, you mentioned we weren't that good. It's ironic because as a rookie, I, I didn't really understand the NFL. You're just kind of, you got blinders on. You're just trying to get through the day without messing anything up and getting dog cussed by a vet. But it was, this was before the, the uh, expansion teams and the alignment. So we were actually AFC central and we, after week three, we had just beat, I think the Pittsburgh Steelers, we were two and one. And I remember Chris Palmer coming in saying, gentlemen, Hey, we're two and one right now. We're tied for first place in the division. You know, that's what we're proud of, but we got a lot of work to do. And, and I remember thinking, man, this is awesome. We're two and one. All right. You know, Hey, things are great. We went three and 13 that year. We, <laughs> we won one more game the entire time oh and by the way you know the bye week that everybody had sprinkled out throughout the season for some right. unknown reason our bye week was week 17 what yeah that's unheard so of literally I, I don't know if it was a mercy bye week like look we'll just end your season before anybody else's <laughs> but we literally had no bye week and we were able to report to camp the same time as the people that played in the hall of fame game you know, if you play in the Hall of Fame game, you could report 14 days before the game. Right. Everybody else had to wait until 14 days before their game. They gave us an exception because we were a new franchise. So oh, we started training season. camp at the same time as the Hall of Fame team and didn't have a bye week until week 17. So, yeah, I mean, it was the longest year ever. I think by that by that time, I was done with football. I was like, this is this is the never ending season and we stink. Um, so, yeah, that was uh, that was an interesting first year to cut your teeth on. Yeah, well, then you get then you get into year two, and Butch Davis comes in from Miami, and uh, I mean, he had that great run at Miami. And you look at that coaching staff. Todd Bowles was on that staff. Uh, yeah. BA Bruce Arians was your offensive coordinator, w- w- and I think Chuck Pagano was uh, was it one of the DB coaches as well, along with Todd Bowles, yeah. right? So that's a great staff. Yeah. I mean, it was an unbelievable staff. Keith Butler was our linebacker coach. He's the D coordinator in Pittsburgh now. Um, Ray Hamilton was a defensive line coach. Uh, Romeo Cornell was with us, I think maybe with Chris Palmer, he was our, our defensive coordinator. Um, but offensively, we also Pete Carmichael Jr. Who was down in New Orleans, who's basically been Sean Payton's right-hand man. He's kind of been like the, you know, the, the assistant offensive coordinator down there. Right. He was our tight ends coach. 
Um, you know, we had some uh, – Todd McNair, who's down in Tampa Bay right now, I think. He was our running back coach. Terry Rubisky was our wide receivers coach. I know you sure. know Rubisky. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it was a star-studded cast. Um, and, you know, they kind of – things kind of got, got blown up a little bit um, in 2002 after we lost the playoff game to the Steelers. But, um, yeah, defensively, you know, we, we had some athletes and, you know, B.A. was my favorite. I, I love playing for B.A. Um, you know, he, he called the play that, that, that yielded me my one and only touchdown. Um, that was all on him. And, and I still to this day give, give Bruce so much credit for instilling confidence in me. And, and, you know, he was one of the first coaches in the NFL that told me, Hey, you belong here. You're a starter. Like you need to act like it. Do you think he's changed much since then? No, no. I think, um, you know, he might, he may be a little heavier. um, (laughs) Aren't we all except you, Mr. Skinny? Man, Helly, let me tell you, like there's to me, there's two types of coaches, right? And and uh, there's coaches that players gravitate towards and then there's cockroach coaches and cockroach coaches are, you know, it's like, you know, like that apartment you had in college and you turn the lights on and the cockroaches just scatter. <laughs> scatter. Everywhere. Like when a, when a coach walks into the cafeteria, everybody just scatters and disappears. That, that's a cockroach coach. Bruce Arians was a complete opposite. He walked in the cafeteria he never sat by himself. Like he sat down. If he sat down at a table by himself, people will come and sit next to him. You know, there were some coaches where it's like, man, if they are in the cafeteria, you will avoid eye contact. You don't want to get talk, small talking. You will not sit down and have a meal with them. BA just has this gravity to him and that people are, you know, you just want to be around him. And he's, he's, he's great. He, he loves people. Um, you know, he's, He's been around the block too. I mean, the guy, you know, was, was a Virginia tech Hokie down in Blacksburg. He coached at temple. Um, he, he's, he's seen every kind of character you can imagine. Um, and, uh, and, and I think his ability to interact with players and build that trust is why he's been so successful. Where did you steal the cockroach coach from? That's brilliant. Um, that's something that I kind of came up with on my own, just uh, talking with somebody about a coach and they were like, Hey, do you like playing for him? And it was like, hell no, like no, nobody likes playing for this guy. And, you know, it was just kind of, uh, that was kind of the, the analogy that I used, you know, cause it always happened. You'd be walking down the hallway and you look up and you'd see a coach that you want, no, you want nothing to do with him. You're looking for a storage closet to bail into, you know, and sometimes it was the training room. Sometimes it was the cafeteria. It's funny. That reminds me of a story. I, you've probably heard this before, but several years ago, I was at uh, Patriots training camp with uh, Willie and we were in the locker room. There weren't many guys in there. Gronk was playing a game of, uh, you know, tape ball with a wiffle ball bat, taking out ceiling tiles. I think Edelman was pitching and was Willie and I were over. The Lombardi trophy as a bat. <laughs> well, he's done that before, as we know. Yeah. Uh, and Willie and I are over talking to, to Brady, right? At the other end of the locker room, those guys are playing at the far end. And all of a sudden I hear, boss on deck. Everything stops. Everybody quiet. Belichick walks through, takes 10 seconds, kind of nods at some guys, makes his way through the locker room. And as soon as he's out, the wiffle ball game begins again. Certainly not a cockroach coach, but not one that he, he, he wasn't engaging with a lot of people when he walked through the locker room there. Yeah. Yeah. Helly, they call that the popo, you know, when, when five ball <laughs> rolls through, right? you know, you send out the doves and you know the birds and, the, um, you know, we used to have a saying, no coaches in the locker room. And yeah. it's funny when I was in Cleveland, Butch Davis would always walk through the locker room, Chris Palmer too. And it's whenever they would walk through, I mean, whoop, 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 here comes the police, here they come. Um, and you know, when I was first with the giants, the same thing happened. Coach Coffer would have to walk through the, the locker room when they, when the giants built their new facility, one of the best parts about it was the coach's locker room was completely separate. So if a coach ever came in our locker room, we would harass the heck out of him Cause we'd say, look, you have no reason to be here. Like there's no reason for you to walk through here. There is no drive-by coaching in the locker room. We have naked men here. You're not allowed to do that. <laughs> you, uh, you went to the giants in, um, in 04. Uh, yeah. you, you signed, you signed your, your first big deal with them. Right. Um, and it was big to me. Bit, yeah. Well, it, it, it's still big. Uh, one of the websites I was looking at recently called you the, the best under the radar free agent signing for the giants in the last, in the last 20 years. How, mm. how, how did that change your, obviously winning the Super Bowl, but how did that change the arc of your career to go to that organization from a place like Cleveland that historically just hadn't won a lot? 
Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think that article may be written by a relative. I don't know. I, I, may, I may have a link to <laughs> Your them. Your pops is a writer now. Yeah. Um, you know what? It's funny because really uh, me signing with the Giants was never supposed to happen. Um, I was a free agent with the Cleveland Browns. And I remember staying in Cleveland in February, which nobody nobody chooses to do. Right. Cleveland in February is is brutal. Um, but I wanted to stay there to, to work out and to go into the building and to show them that I was committed. And look, I wanted to be a Cleveland Brown. So um, I remember my agents calling me and saying, look, free agency is coming up. Um, it's it's going to be a little hectic. Things are going to happen fast. So, you know, if you want to go, go on vacation or go see your family or do whatever, do it before free agency starts because it may be a whirlwind. So I'm like, all right, you know what? I'm going to drive home, see mom and dad. Um, so I drove from Cleveland back home to New Jersey. And, you know, I was just spending a couple of days with my parents um, at their house in Hillsborough, New Jersey. And I remember it was like a Thursday and my agent said, look, you're going to fly to Arizona on Sunday. I think maybe go to Cincinnati on Monday. We were starting to map out our trip. Free agency started, I think, that Friday or Saturday. And the, my agent was on the phone with the Giants talking about a different player. And they said, hey, you also represent Sean O'Hara, right? What's his story? What's going on with him? Um, you know, we, we need some offensive linemen too. So that little conversation, you know, it was like, well, actually, you know, he's actually in New Jersey right now visiting his parents. So they were like, all right, we'll call you back. Within hours, the Giants were in the mix. They knew I was in New Jersey. And it went from, all right, I'm packing a bag to fly to Arizona on Sunday morning to would you be willing to drive up on Saturday from your house in Hillsboro, which is about 45, 50 minutes up to, to Giant Stadium and meet with the coaches? And, it, and so I'm like, yeah, absolutely. All right, let's do it. So originally I was going to fly to Arizona and then come back and see the Giants after that. But they were like, no, we want to see you first. So I literally got in the car. I drove myself up to the facility. I mean, you want to talk about the free agent visit, you know, like people, they fly you in on a private jet, take you out of dinner. No, I drove myself. <laughs> all right. This, this is how undrafted free agent O-Lyman get recruited. Yeah. Drive yourself. We'll, we'll give you a voucher for parking. Um, <laughs> so I drove up and um, met with the giants and started talking to them and met coach Coughlin. Um, it's a funny story about my online coach, um, you know, that, that I'll, uh, I'll get back to if we, I'll circle back to if, if we have time, but, um, went out to dinner with the online coach, Pat Flaherty. Um, and you know, during dinner, my agents call me and text me and they're like, Hey, the giants are, they, they're picking up speed here. They really like you. They, they're thinking they want to offer you a contract. Should we engage in all? So I'm like, well, yeah, let's do it. Let's see what happens. Mm -hmm. By the end of that dinner, we had a contract basically ironed out and they, they said, look, we agreed to it in principle by that night. So literally that's how fast free agency wow. happens. And they put me, they gave me a hotel room. That, that was my, that was my big perk uh, at the Sheridan right there. You probably stayed in anytime. you. Oh, yeah, I have. Um, so I, I get back to the hotel. I text one of my college buddies. I'm like, pick me up. I'm at the Sheridan. We're going, we're going to Hoboken. And, you know, my buddies from college were all there and they didn't even know I was home because I didn't tell anybody because I was just going home to see mom and dad. And we go into the bar and I order like 20 shots. And I'm like, boys, I'm like, I just want to salute to all of you and say, you're looking at the newest member of the New York Giants. And that was how they all found out. And we were all in Hoboken when it happened. I had a couple of buddies that lived in Hoboken, a couple of buddies that lived in the city. Um, and we kind of celebrated that night. So uh, I'll just say this. I, I got made it back to the hotel room at 6 a.m. for my 7 a.m. physical. Um, I, don't, I have no idea how I passed uh, but for the Giants, but... <laughs> Um, that, that's my lesson that I tell people I, when it's kids, I leave out that celebration part, but I tell them good things always happen when you go see mom. That is a bad ass story with all your boys too. And you, Oh yeah. We, around it was, we were at, we were at 10th and Willow in Hoboken. If anybody's ever been there, they have great wings and, um, and the shots were pretty cheap. Oh God. That, that's amazing. So you get there in 04. Um, was that, was that was Eli's first year? Yeah, we drafted Eli that spring. Um, ironically enough, when I came to the Giants, Kerry Collins was the quarterback. You know, the, he had gotten hurt the year before, and it was a it was an awful season. Fossil got fired. Um, they were banged up all across the board. And then Coughlin came in in 2004. Um, Kerry Collins was on the team. The first minicamp, it was Kerry Collins was a starter, and I was the center. So I was snapping to him. 
And then um, when they drafted Eli, Kerry came in the next day and said, cut me. So they cut Kerry Collins. And then about three weeks later, we signed Kurt Warner. Kurt, sure. So Kurt came in and Kurt ended up being the starter. And then, um, you know, as he, uh, as he loves when I remind him, he got benched for Eli and, and we had a winning <laughs> record. So I, I tease him all the time. You're the only quarterback in the history of the NFL to get benched with a winning record. Yeah. He, he, uh, he, he loves that story. Not so much. Um, yeah. love Kurt again. Kurt was on a couple of weeks ago, stopped by his, uh, oh, yeah, his sure. house. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> great, great big backyard. Pad. Very, He's very, very ranch. It, it's unbelievable. Uh, He's got yes. a full basketball court. Yeah. Yeah. Indoor, indoor and outdoor as he likes to remind me sean the one time i went there and played in a game with him and uh remember remember devin bush the running back yeah. played for the cardinals yeah. for a little while and a couple other guys i uh i had heard stories from kurt i think akbar baja Biamila went to play there and uh was not overly impressive when they played right and kurt's a really good basketball player so this was during the super bowl a few years back and I, I just, I had had some back issues, wasn't moving around real well, but I'm like, I have to show up and I have to play or Kurt's going to talk shit about me forever. Yeah. So I went with Casey Schwab. Remember Casey, the, uh, yeah. the lawyer that, that worked with the network and then went to Fox and now he's, he's doing some licensing stuff. Um, anyway, Casey and I had played together a bunch before Casey ends up having this career night, just like hitting these mid range jumpers, these little turnarounds, you know, he's like, six foot one from Wisconsin. And he was like doing work in the paint. And I'm like, what is going on? I just couldn't move. I couldn't hit a shot. I couldn't, I couldn't do anything. Kurt thought and still thinks I am the single worst basketball player on earth and loves to repeatedly oh. remind me of that, whether it's on Twitter or wherever it is. Like he, yeah. Kurt's relentless. He does not let yeah. shit go. No, no. He loves to hammer people. He, he will come down oh. on you for sure. God is so crazy. So, so Kurt was there. Eli was there. Your first season though, you had, what would you have a staff infection or something? Yeah, I got banged up. Um, ironically enough, uh, Kurt actually fell on my ankle. It was a quarterback sneak. And, and I still tease him to this day. I'm like, dude, you're a quarterback sneak and you fell like right on me. <laughs> like, and it, was, it wasn't even like get a reason. So uh, I, I hurt my ankle. Actually, that was after I came back, but I, and I ended up with a staph infection and uh, ended up uh, spending a couple of days in the hospital, which was not nice, but uh, I met my wife there. So uh, things worked out. Oh, was that, that's where you met Amy during yeah, that time? Yeah, I met her. I was, uh, I had to go to HSS, which is the hospital for special surgery in New York city. And um, you know, it was like on a Wednesday I got up and my leg was sore and it was like, I had this like red spot down by my ankle and it was hot. And I went to practice. I told the trainers about it. They kind of drew a circle around it. And they were like, if this gets any bigger, you know, we're, we got a problem. Well, the next day, Thursday, I came in and it was like, it was exponentially bigger. So they said, all right, you're going into the city to see the doctor. And I went in, I'm in like giant sweatpants and gear. and I got nothing with me. I thought I was going to, you know, get some, some medicine and then get back to practice. Um, they admit me to the hospital. They put me on IV vancomycin, which is like the strongest antibiotic you can get. Um, and they were worried that it was MRSA. Uh, so I ended up, you know, spending five days in the hospital. Um, and my wife, Amy came in the second day that I was in the hospital and, you know, I'm in bed here. I'm shaving in like three days and this beautiful nurse comes walking in and I'm like, I'm like, no way. I felt like Cole trickle from days of thunder. Um, <laughs> You know, Nicole Kimmer walks in and I'm like, well, hello. So uh, actually, I think my parents were in the room too. And I look at my dad and he's like, mm, that's, that's, that's a good looking nurse. So uh, I had to play it cool um, <laughs> and uh, managed to get her number before I left. And, um, and we've been together ever since. Yeah. yeah. I mean, this phrase is so overused, I think, in relationships. But um, at the, you're at the top of my friend list where I'll kick your coverage, by the way, bro. Good work. <laughs> All right. I, I'm happy to be on the top of, of, of any list in your world. <laughs> that's, that's certainly a good one to, uh, to be on. Sure, I, I, yeah. I'm right there with you, bro. I'm not scared um, of Reggie Roby. Yeah. Oh, Hey, why not? Why not? Um, 2007, that, uh, that run that ended in the Super Bowl against the undefeated giants. There was a really cool, um, segment that SNY did with your entire offensive line. Um, with, with, uh, Everybody, right? It was Soybert and Snee and Deal and you. What was that? That was not that long ago. Um, they got you guys all together on a Zoom call. It was, uh, it was, um, 
gosh, I'm trying to remember the name of it. You, you guys were all on a Zoom call talking about oh, yeah, 07. Like we, ne- like we never left. Yeah, uh, yes. Yeah, Ra- Ralph Facciano with the New York Daily News set it up and uh, kind of, it was a little reunion of, of the office of line. And uh, yeah, it was pretty cool. It was fun to, fun to get the band back together and, and bust chops a little bit. Well, they, I think it was Snee that said the Patriots just didn't respect you guys, the defensive line. And they were talking shit during yeah. the game and, I believe he said that Seymour, Richard Seymour, invited you guys to their post-game celebration party during the game. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, Seymour was talking so much shit, like, the whole game. Like, you know, and he it was, like, little stuff like, yeah, enjoy that flight home, you know, like, you know, you all suck. And, you know, I mean, just the normal banter. But, um, but yeah, he was he was talking trash. He wasn't the only one. I mean, there was a couple of guys, like, they, they thought they had it in the bag. They'd already beat us in Week 17. Right. They were undefeated. They had the best offense in the league. And, you know, they, they, they were already playing in their post part, post game parties, but uh, yeah, Seymour, you know, he, he definitely talked a lot of junk. Look, he's, he's a heck of a player. He was a handful. You know, we definitely had our, our work cut out for, uh, for us, but, you know, I also, somebody kind of sent me a message saying, you know, that he was talking about on social media, I think it was Twitter that, you know, he, if he hadn't been held, he would have had another ring. And, you know, I just thought that was pretty comical because, you know, it was me and Richie Soybert that were supposed to be blocking him and Jarvis Green, the nose tackle. And, you know, I, I chuckled because I'm like, man, Seymour, you you had Eli Manning in the grasp. Like, if there's an easier quarterback to break down than Eli Manning, I don't know who he is. But the <laughs> fact that you couldn't get Eli down, like, to me, that makes you look bad. Don't don't tell me that you were held. You weren't nobody held you. We, we just blocked you longer than you were willing to tackle Eli. That's all we gave bigger effort. Um, and, and that would kind of be my thing, but you know, a lot of people kind of tease me too about, they say, Oh, you guys were holding on that play and you've probably done it too. And, you know, I clutching is, is what I call it. There's, you know, we don't hold, but we clutch. I and mean, if you're squeezing, that's fine. But during that play, you know, as Seymour was grabbing Eli, I kind of, I felt my hand kind of slide up to his throat a little bit. And yep. I just remember thinking like, just squeeze, man, just squeeze. And I just, I just remember just squeezing his trachea as hard as I possibly could and just trying everything I could to, uh, to, to get him to, to let go. And Hey, it worked. What, what was that play called? Do you remember in the huddle? I think it was, I think it was 76 max Y union. And then where, where was it supposed to go? Because I'm assuming Tyree was not the um, first option on that play. Yeah, no, I, I think it was either supposed to go to Pry Plax or uh, Steve Smith. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it definitely wasn't supposed to go to Tyree. And to be honest with you, if, if you watch that play, there's two things that I love pointing out. Next time you watch that play, Helly, watch our right guard, Chris Nee. He blocks nobody. Like, the ball snap, and he just – he's literally traffic cop. <laughs> I mean, he's standing there like he's got nothing to do. He's, he touches nobody the entire play. And at one point he turns around and he's looking at Eli as Eli's got guys draped all over him. And you could see Eli almost thinks about throwing him the ball. And Eli said, he's like, I saw Snee it just flashing. I was like, getting the ball. I'm like, no, I can't do that. So, you know, Eli was shocked to get out of that, that grasp. And then somehow, I don't know how he saw David Tyree um down the field but you know he just thought hey i'm just gonna give him a shot and um you know the second part to that play is i love teasing bob papa he's a good friend of mine and i love his work he does a great work his radio call of that play manning somehow escapes and throws to a wide open tyree <laughs> <laughs> and the video shows Tyree is not wide open. Definitely not. He has Roddy Harrison draped all over him. And Roddy Harrison is climbing him like a ladder to try to get this ball. And I always tease Papa. I'm like, wide open Tyree. Yeah. I mean, that, and he's like, <laughs> he was open. He was wide open when he let the ball go. And I'm like, no, no. So, uh, yeah. Chris Snee and Bob Papa, if you want to bust chops, uh, that play right there is, is right in their wheelhouse. Hey, play by play is not easy. Okay. Color analyst. Not easy. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Dude, you mentioned you mentioned Eli. Um, I, I saw somewhere that the Giants are going to try to carve out a role for him. Um, not you know more like a front office type advisor type role. Um, do you think he's going to be good at that? No. <laughs> <laughs> Number one, that, that's the first that I've heard of, of that. Um, 
you know, I, I, I don't know what, I don't know what, what's he like an advisor? Is he going to teach people how to handle their Twitter accounts? I don't he's going to he be doesn't... a mentor. Hey, by the way, he's doing a hell of a job with Twitter. And he, he posted recently, you know, the mask that you sent him with the goofy Eli face, which was awesome. Yeah. Well, what, you know, what's funny is I love how you commend him for his Twitter game. And when you think that if he had a good Twitter game, he would know how to tag somebody or put their handle on it. Did he not? So do I that? sent, I sent him a mask to wear with his picture on it and he sends out a tweet about it, but he doesn't tag your boy in it. Like, does he do so his that, own? Yeah, he, he does his own stuff. I did tease him about that. I'm like, yeah, tell your handler. They're not doing a very good job of tagging <laughs> people. And if you're going to post something about somebody, feel free to let them know. Um, but yeah, he has been, he's been really good. And to be honest with you, I never thought he would join Twitter. We've been hammering him for a couple of years about doing it. He never would do it while he was playing because he didn't want to deal with that. But He's done a really good job of just kind of opening up and letting people kind of see that that dry humor that he has and the personality. And uh, he's done a pretty good job of it. I think uh, my favorite stuff is his Frank's Red Hot stuff. You know, he puts that shit on everything. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And and he says it a couple of times, which is kind of, you know, that's a little bit for him. That's toe in the line. Uh, but I think for the Giants, it, it, any role that they could bring him back in and have him be a part of that franchise is a good move on their on their uh, behalf, and they should absolutely do it. Uh, to, to really answer your question, I think he would be a great asset, not just for the quarterbacks, but you know, just for the players, just to, you know, for ha- to have him be around um, and come around the team, and then and also for for the Giants, you know, he's been such a great ambassador for the league and for the franchise, um, and I think that's one of the reasons why he was so beloved in New York. You know, look, he, he would say no to things that most people would jump at and say yes to, but, but he kind of understood, like, my number one job is to be the quarterback of the New York Giants. I'm not trying to be a celebrity. I'm not trying to be, you know, the, the biggest, brightest thing in New York City. I've seen how that worked out for people, and he's always done a really good job of, of controlling that scene. There's so many guys um, who get into their post-playing careers, and they get into media, and um, eventually they fade out and do something else. Uh, I, I think you would be great in an NFL front office. Is that something I, you know, I know coaching is a different deal, um, but has, has working for the giants or another team, if that, I know you have young children, but is, has that ever crossed your mind? Um, yeah. You know what? It's, it's something that I've thought a lot uh, more about recently. Um, you know, Chris Snee has actually been doing some scouting and, um, you know, I, I know that he's kind of going that, that route and it's, you know, the one thing I, that you do miss, you miss being a part of a team, you miss, you know, miss the scoreboard, you know, and, yeah. and you know, in, in TV, you know, look, I, it used to drive me nuts. You know, you do a show 17 weeks in a row and everybody after the show, Hey, great show, great show. I'm like, oh, look, there's no way we had a great show every week. Like, let's, let, let's like be real here. Let's, let's improve on things. Let's, you know, there's no scoreboard. So. I think that would be fun. I think building a team and being a part of all that would be really cool. Um, you know, you're seeing some guys do it. John Lynch uh, with the 49ers, yeah. you know, he's doing a really good job. We saw Mayock make the shift uh, with the Raiders doing that. Dan Morgan has been doing a phenomenal job. I, he's going to be a GM soon. Um, I ran he's in Buffalo, right? Summer. He's up in Buffalo. Yeah. He's, he's working under Brandon Bean. Um, you know, he started down in Carolina doing some things. So, Um, I think that you're going to start to see a lot more players kind of segue into that because it's a way to be around football. Um, Like you said, you're not coaching, you're not, you're not game day, you're not doing X and O's, but it's really cool to kind of see, all right, how do we evaluate these players? What's important to us and and, and how are you going to build the franchise? Um, You know, there's definitely some, some intrigue there. Well, you certainly got a lot left in the tank in terms of broadcasting. I think you're awesome, dude. You've always been one of my favorites. Um, we have gone longer than I promised you we would go. I do appreciate the time. I can hear the kiddos in the background. So um, yeah, they're chomping at the bit. They're, they're ready for daddy, but uh, yeah, it's been a pleasure, man. I always enjoy hanging out with you. I always enjoy uh, talking with you. I miss you, pal. I miss hanging out with you and, and uh, you know, calling games and um, you know, I'll, uh, I, I'll come on your helipod anytime you want. And um, you know, you could pay me just the same amount that the Alliance paid me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was a that was a good ten week run where neither one of us got paid. All right, yeah. um, hey, I hope you can make it through the weather. It is uh, it's seventy degrees and sunny right now, so I'm gonna head outside. I'll be you thinking of all gun. my friends. All right, I I hope you chafe yourself on your walk. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you, bud. I'll talk to you soon, man. All right, all right buddy.